Hi folks, I'm International Master John Watson, and this is Ask the Master on ICC-TV. The main idea of this show is to provide you, the viewers, with a forum to ask questions about chess and the chess world. Uh, the best way to do this is to send me an email at askimwatson at chessclub.com. That's A-S-K-I-M-W-A-T-S-O-N at chessclub.com. Let me, in the meantime move my windows out of the way here so I can see your chat and you people are on the chat. Another way is to ask questions live right now on the chat which is on the right of this YouTube broadcast and a third way is if you're an ICC member to message John L. Watson, that's one word, John L. Watson, J-O-H-N-L-W-A-T-S-O-N. We A lot of the questions I get are about openings. I've also been sent a lot of games recently so you can send me your games. And uh, we can talk about anything, chess history, chess, uh, speaking of chess history, I just noticed just a couple hours ago that the, on the FIDE rating list, uh, the average rating of the top 10 players is now infinitesimally over 2,800. So that isn't that astonishing, um, a 2,800 average top 10 players, and that, that's scary. Um, where was I? So you can ask about chess strategy, uh, how to improve, uh, all kinds of other things. We usually don't get, I can't get to all the questions that I get, but I want to have as many as I can so I can ch pick and choose among them. A lot of times I get tied down with the chat and don't get to everything. But, you know, a lot of these questions, even if you've asked them and I said, well, I'll try to get to that next week, you know, you might, I'll try to get to, I keep them all and I've got them all there and I pretty much answer them all, but I just don't get to them. So that means I will get to them eventually, even if it's four weeks later or whatever. So just keep listening and you'll probably get your question answered eventually. Um, now let me see, what do I have here? I have uh, the chat. Uh, I wanted to, let me see, there's some technical things maybe to answer first. Regarding my Facebook list of openings, now there's a list of openings uh, that we've covered for the last couple of years on this show, however long it's lasted. So everything we've ever covered in terms of openings is given in terms of the name of the opening and the ECO code, if you know what that is, and you can get used to that very easily. On my Facebook page at John L. Watson, and this time it's three words, uh, John L., L as in Lion, Watson, three words. And uh, someone asked me about, by the way, I should... Somebody asked me, had trouble getting there, um, so I will try to answer that maybe next week. It seems to me most people are getting there pretty easily because I get quite a few comments about them. Uh, but someone asked me about finding the times. In other words, you can go to those shows. They're all on YouTube, archived, so you can find the date of the show. You can go there, and then I've told you, well, you can find something about the Scahavid against Sicilian on that particular show. That would be maybe on my list on Facebook. The problem is, is that where does that appear on the show? And the way to find that out, now he wanted me to put times for all of the openings. That's getting a little bit exotic um, and time consuming. So the easy way to do that is hold down the left mouse key. So get to the show on YouTube, the one with the date that I've given, and then hold down the left, left mouse key and start playing the show. And then roll, uh, as you hold down the key, scroll over to the right and you'll see pictures of everything that's up on the screen. So you'll see all the positions because the positions are up there in the background and you can just scroll over, it goes really quickly. You can find your position probably within five to 15 seconds, maybe maybe slightly more, but just, just scroll over and at the point, and when you see the position appearing of that opening, then just stop and you can start the tape at that point and see what I had to say. Okay, so I think I hope that was self-evident. If not, uh, maybe listen to it again and practice it a little bit. But but if you go to the shows on on YouTube, the archived shows, and scroll along, you can find out what posi what positions appeared. In fact, theoretically, you don't even have to go to the list. You could go to these shows, but you'd have to go one by one by one to see what I've covered. So you really should look at the list. Okay, um, let me look at the chat really fast. Alan, uh, we're still talking about. Uh, Nigel Davies, the Welshman. Uh, I went to the tourney as him. I have a few games I'd like to show from the event. One is a 13 move game. One game with me as Black went. Blah blah blah. Yeah, well, I can't show them. I can't show your games during our show, but I can uh, show these moves that you're showing. 
which is D4. Uh, you can send me the game, so of course, Alan, if you want to show things uh, by email, as you know. Okay, so here's a London system. Oh, a trick here, some kind of trick. E3, G5. G5 does not strike me as a great move. It's a trick. <laughs> Who played this? With U.S. Black, okay. <laughs> I don't, I don't really like this move. I think, I think that it's awfully weakening. But the idea, of course, is that if he takes it, you have this nice move, and you, or you can go home already, or go get a drink at the pub. Um, <laughs> so that's a cute idea. So Alan, that was cute. Good, good, good try. I guess your opponent played here, and um, now you have a kind of weakness here. It's, it's not that bad. I mean, I think, I think if the pawn were here or. Somehow, if, if having a bishop here was worth a little more, the, the, having the bishop there, it's, it's running into some, a very solid position. So it's still a good piece on g7, but it's not having that much effect. So the move g5 hasn't gained maybe as enough to make up for the fact that that's a big weakness. But uh, it's fun, fun play. And it's certainly not a terrible move. I mean, it gets some, gets some space and gets a piece out. Um, <laughs> okay, Colin says hi. Get some highs in here. High moving Dutchman, yes, okay. High and ears. Oh, we have everybody. All right, okay. Since I don't have a specific question, which is good because I can get to some of the things I've been asked. Um, oh, you, oh, but from uh, the previous chat, I wanted to look at a few things. Harmless asked, uh, What's a good book on the Queen's Gambit decline for black? And John Thomas mentioned Jim Rizzitano's Queen's Gambit decline and also. Gary Kasparov's video on the Queen's Gambit decline, which I think is excellent. It's one of the best videos he did, actually, was the Queen's Gambit decline video. Really excellent. Um, those are both uh, old, but they're both good. And so that those are possibilities. And I wanted to mention another old book. It's funny to mention older books, but um, there was a book by, my, um, uh, by Michael Sadler, uh, which was called The Queen's Gambit Declined, or I think. Oh, golly, it might have been called Play The Queen's Gambit Declined or something like that. It's a um, everyman book, and he uses the Socratic method, and he has somebody ask him questions, so why would you play there and why would you play there? And this was just such a wonderful book. The funny thing is, is that even though it's kind of introducing you to The Queen's Gambit Declined, it had all kinds of great theory. And when I wrote my book, well, several books, but when I was writing my section on the... Um, Queen's Gambit for the uh, Mastering the Chess Opening series I actually used his book for the theory as well as for the, the practice. He does a wonderful job with move orders and kind of describing why certain move orders work and why they don't. So that's um, uh, Sadler, The Queen's Gambit Declined, or just if you Google that, you'll get that. It might be Play the Queen's Gambit Declined or something like that. Um, but it's an absolutely incredible book. It won the English Federation Book of the Year Award which shows how much people liked it. Usually, normally a, a sort of a lower level opening book isn't even considered for, um, it's not really, lower level's really the wrong word because it could be used by quite a strong player, but, but still, I mean, the approach was for the student and uh, just a wonderful book. Okay, now from last week, I have, um, ah, there we go. John Thomas prefers the Rizzitano book. That's, that's John Thomas, pretty advanced player, for one thing, and um, I thought the Sadler book was just extremely readable, uh, f especially for students. A lot of people like a lot of words, for one thing, and there's a lot of words, but I'm not going to argue that the Rizzitano book isn't a very, very good book. Hello, John. Uh, Alan, the other game with me, well, I'll, 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 I'll collaborate here for a second. Alan gets credit for getting on the uh, chat early and preparing all this great stuff. Okay, so he says there's another game in the tournament he was just in. This is called the English Defense, by the way. Um, for black, we've talked about it just a little bit, d3, that's kind of a concession, it means that, that white feels he really hasn't gotten anything special out of the opening, c5 is a pretty good answer, there are other ways to meet this actually, g3, knight c6, this is all playable for both sides, bishop g2, d6, oh he's playing sort of the solid way for, as black, there's ways to play more dynamically as black, 92 is more natural. It's what more, more people play, 92. This is just small points. Knight f6, e5. Yeah, question mark, exclamation is right. It doesn't look right to me at all. I don't, don't like the looks of it. But he makes a mistake. He plays uh, pawn takes. I don't understand why he wouldn't play knight takes, or even what white's point is exactly. Is knight takes a good move? 
yeah, I mean, it's just a pawn, isn't it? Because the knight can't take because of bishop takes, and then this check won't do any good. So, um, yeah, I don't don't know what's going on here. Looks looks just bad. Um, but uh, black doesn't play that black place here, which looks like a mistake because of knight takes. Um, maybe. I mean, actually, black's very solid here with queen's rook c8 and queen c7. Queen c7 is even with tempo. It should really be okay here. I guess bishop f4 would be the idea. Or takes in bishop f4. Wow. Yeah, I don't think this is very dangerous because even if bishop f4 here, now normally e5 would be a strange move because the bishop takes, but the queen's retaking with check. So this is actually working out very nicely for black. So he wouldn't be able to play bishop f4. He'd probably have to just castle. And then, of course, the problem with a position like this is black controls d4, and he's doing okay in development. It's not like black's that far behind in development. So black's bound to be at least equal here, probably, maybe, maybe even a little better. Well, probably just equal, because his bishop isn't that good. Um, but it's very, it's harmless, so white hasn't achieved much. Okay, so this is not the end of the world. Uh, I don't know what, let me, let me see what happened in the game. Uh, queen c8, double question mark. Oh, because of queen a4. Yeah, because queen a4, uh-oh, there goes a piece. Uh, bishop d6 captures... Uh, castles, you'd think he'd try queen d7 to pin the knight, but anyway, castles, uh, what do white play? Bishop f4, exclam question mark. Well, there's no threat here at all, you could just castle, for example. Yeah, I don't understand this, this is just a piece, white's a piece ahead for really nothing here. Uh, but he tries this bizarre move, which doesn't look that bad, I assume e5. Well, no, he took it in a lot of 97. Well, anyway, we're seeing some uh, not quite high-quality chess being played here, particularly by black. So, although white also, e5 was kind of a weak move, too. Oh, Alan, it's your game. Here I am insulting him. Um, yeah, the e5 move is just too ambitious, as you noticed, but after queen c8, you had him going, didn't you? From then on, he played perfectly. And uh, you must have been very happy when he played bishop f4. <laughs> Terrific. All right. Okay. So, well, you had fun anyway. Did he resign? I hope he resigned. Um, <laughs> sorry, Alan. I didn't mean to insult your game, but that well, not not a high quality game. You have to admit, but especially especially by black. And, uh, and watch out with a move like e5, because you know you can be just a pawn down for nothing. That's not really worth it if you're playing someone good. Do your checks captures forcing moves? I mean, if you looked at knight e5, you wouldn't have played that move, right? Here I am criticizing you when you want a short very pretty game with a nice fork but um i don't when you're sitting here thinking about playing e5 the first thing to think about is what are the checks for black well he doesn't have any what are the captures and and you might look at takes and think well i can play knight takes e5 and all the black's fine there but at least it's a game it's an interesting game and uh but then you have to look at your other capture look at all the captures and the other capture would have been knight takes and you probably would have given up at this point i mean you look at a few other things you look at queen a4 check and you look at taking and hope there's a miracle but um, anyway, good. remember, before you make your move, check the obvious captures and all that. And then after that, it was a lot of fun for you. Okay, going uh, with the G5, another theme. <laughs> all right, we'll do that. I'll, I'll never get to the questions, of course, if I'm not careful. But it's more fun doing the chat, isn't it? Okay, E6, <laughs> uh, G3, G5. Oh, my God. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's vaguely playable. You have the idea of playing like, you know, maybe you can get uh, bishop e7 and h5, h4 in. Uh, Rapport-like g5 variation. Yeah. I, I played I played a line like this at a tournament against a master and barely, you know, it was worse all game and finally drew. Um, seems better than it first appears, ideas. Okay, so the idea is to play h5, h4. And, for example, if he plays, let's say he plays, I don't know, let's say he plays here. Uh, and you play here. The natural move is here, blocking h5, h4, but then you have bishop e7. I don't know if you have it immediately, but it's certainly an idea, right? <clears throat> and then if the knight, well, the knight can't even move, can it? But even if the knight could retreat, you'd have h5, h4. So, so that's kind of a theme in a position like that. Um, so what should white do? Well, there's always h3, unfortunately. And the problem then is that when you play h5, trying to play for h4, you need another tempo. You've got to play bishop here before you can play g4. In other words, um, if he played some natural move like this, attacking here, g4 isn't going to work because after takes, you can't take back because of rook takes rook. Common theme. 
yeah, it's good to know these kinds of things. Uh, so you'd have to go slow and defend that, which is not much fun. Yikes. Um, maybe h5 was just a bad move. I think I'm, I'm not saying, chess philosopher, that, that this is that, that, that h5 is the best move. Maybe black has a better, well, black must have a better idea. Because now white's just way ahead in development, and black still can't play g4. Okay, so what that means is my, my h5 move was a blunder, but what should what should black do? Hmm. Problem is, if he just develops, you know, you've got this move with tempo here, and you have to play h6 probably. You don't want to block off your own bishop, see? See, this is attack twice, everybody. I hope I'm not going too fast. And uh, has to be defended, and that's a very negative move because it blocks off your own bishop. It also exposes your king. You know, got even indirect problems with that. So um, h6. Well, you know, this is not the end of the world for black, but he's behind in development, and he's got weaknesses. You don't – moving your kingside pawns early like this can be a little dangerous long term. You know, usually you only do that if you're going to gain the two bishops by force or maybe somehow force a compromise, or win some time on the king side. And here you haven't really gained any time. So, you know, white's a little better. Now black can play a position like this. not the end of the world. It's just chess. You certainly don't resign, that's for sure. Just playing a game. But um, I don't think most good players would be real happy with this because they haven't gained much by playing h5 and h6. Anyway, interesting question. Um... Alan was white. Yeah, no, I knew Alan was white, and and Alan made that bad move e5, but everything else went really well, right? He made the he won the queen. He played a nice game. It was a pretty game. I was just kind of warning him to be careful about that move e5 on move eight. If you scroll up there, see that move e5, which he rightly gives a question exclam. But uh, so Alan played an enterprising game and a fun game, but uh, I was just making a little criticism that he shouldn't give away pawns for nothing in the opening. <laughs> <laughs> Got to be critical. We're trying to learn here, right? So um, now, what else have we got here? We've got... Ah, well, let me go to the next game. Also from the chat, I think, last week. Uh, Colin asks, uh, I've seen a lot of games where Black just suffers and suffers in the Brayer, like the recent Caruana game, which, by the way, I should have dug up and put up on the screen, but I didn't. But I did mention, he says, are there any main lines where Black gets an aggressive position? And I wanted to show you that game I mentioned by my friend Jim Tarjan against Shiroff, which I thought was just a fascinating game. So let me do that. Let me see if I can find it first. Okay, and that would be um, here. Okay. So there's the Roy Lopez. Now, the Brayer defense is very complicated. A lot of you who are just starting out don't play defenses that start on move 9 or whatever. But... Um, Basically, these are main moves of the Roy Lopez that have been played for year after year after year, uh, literally hundreds of thousands of games from this position as White. White just defended his pawn, by the way. And um, Black simply plays d6. You know, the Marshall Gambit is this famous thing with castles first, so that if White plays here, you can blast away in the center. And that's a whole different issue. White, uh, White's been avoiding that recently with Kasparov's old move, uh, the, the anti-Marshall with a4. But anyway, that's that's neither here nor there. Plain d6 has certain advantages, and one of them is that if you're going to play the Brayer variation, it's a nice order. Um, uh, actually, it's better against a4, so that's probably the reason to play d6 first. Okay, so white plays here. These are all, as I said, been played a million times. There's the Brayer line, which was became popular really, I think, in the 1960s, and Spassky played perhaps 20 games with this. And uh, it, the idea, it looks crazy, but the idea is that you, your knight just isn't that well placed here anymore. You know, the main old line was to play here and put it on a kind of a funny square. So he's putting on another funny square. Why would you want to move it? It's because once you put it on d7, which is kind of where it really belongs, it strong points the square, covers the c5 square, which is kind of interesting, keeps your bishop open. If your bishop goes to b7, it keeps it nice and open. It's not blocked by a knight on c6. And, uh, and it doesn't block the c-pawn, so the c-pawn can go to either c6 or c5, and it goes to both those squares in, in different variations. Um, so anyway, I'm not going to try and describe all the ideas behind the Brayer, but the main idea is strong point this square, but get out of the way of your pieces and get out of the way of your c-pawn. The, the disadvantage, of course, is that that's awfully slow, making three moves of the knight in the opening. Um, 
But of course, White's made moves. This rook here is a good move, but it, it's not even an open file. And he's made this move h3. You know, he's, he's played kind of slowly in a lot of ways. So maybe you have time to reorganize. That's the thought. Okay, White develops. A lot of times White's going to move this knight over here and attack. Or to e3. Black attacks this pawn, which holds down this knight for a second. If the knight moves, you're going to have knight takes pawn. Um, and he gets a piece out, and he's ready to um, connect rooks and do good things. Um, so white goes back to defend that pawn so that he can move his knight. Otherwise, he can't really get his bishop into play. So now this pawn is defended twice on e4. Black plays rook e8, indirectly attacking that pawn, because there can be an e takes d4 at some point. Now he's going to have to play bishop f8 first, but that's a useful move anyway. White does the plan I was talking about, about moving the knight over. So you can see why black wasn't too worried about making extra moves with his knight, because here is white make, making one, two, three moves with his knight. So it's have, this is all heavy positional maneuvering that's extremely well known for a million years. This has been played in, in thousands of games, believe it or not. Um, and black plays there. Now that's, a, that's one reason why the bishop's well placed on f8 is because what black wants to play this move g6 to keep that knight from coming in on those squares and with the bishop on f8 it, he can cover the dark squares and he can even put it on g7 where it's going to have extra influence on the center so white places move b3 there's a bunch of moves played here but that's probably the main one actually um traditionally it's the main one it's the one that's been played most often a little hard to describe. Uh, one thing is that in the future it, it protects against a piece going here like a, a knight. The other thing is if you're going to play d5, maybe you can play c4, which is now better supported. The other thing is that a4 sometimes is more effective when b3 is in. I don't know if I even want to describe why that is. But uh, one, of, one of White's plan is to play a, a3 and sometimes things like bishop d3 and queen e2 and just pressure the queen side until black has to make a concession move over there and weaken himself. So White's play often is on the queen's side, even though it looks like he's piling up his pieces on the king's side. The great thing about some of these classic Rui Lopez positions is black can play on the queen's side, black can play on the king's side, black can play in the center, and guess what? White can play on the, uh, the king's side, white can play on the queen's side, and white can play on the center. So it's one of those wonderful openings like the king's ending where both sides can play on all sectors of the board. All right, so um, you notice there have been no exchanges either, which always makes things more interesting. Okay, white, black fiend shadows his bishop. It makes sense. He might take that at some point, opening up his rook and his bishop. He also strong points that key e5 square. And white commits dramatically. I found 446 games from this position, and the interesting thing is this position wasn't really arrived at, well, at least in megabase, until 1960, which is fairly late, but that's right when the Brayer was becoming popular. Uh, and the other interesting thing is you asked about aggression by black, and what are some aggressive lines? And it's interesting that this um, this line, which has been played constantly, is still played all the time, uh, contains a lot of aggressive potential. And the first game I could find with it was with Michael Tall as black. So that's kind of fun, that we have uh, Tall as black, who's an aggressive player. And that already indicates that maybe there are aggressive potential in this position. All right, anytime you have all the pieces left on the board and there's an imbalanced pawn structure, you've usually got aggressive potential. And that's the great thing about the Brayer. And Spassky, one of the most aggressive players of his time, uh, played the Brayer, as I say, obsessively. Played it all the time. So you know that there are aggressive ideas. Now, there are variations recently like uh, that you you can still be aggressive against, but a lot, but, but <laughs> why am I going to say this? Some players are trying to play more solidly as black. They have aggressive options, but they're trying to... Remember, a lot of the very top players uh, are trying to draw as black, or, or they're very happy with the draw as black. So they're willing to play slow moves and very solid moves. Maybe they want to open it up later as white, but the, their first goal is to get a very solid game. So you may be under the impression that black is, has a defensive position in the Briar, but I think sometimes he gets that defensive position uh, intentionally, even though he had options. Oh, by the way, this move rook c8, for years, everybody played knight b6 here. That was just almost automatic. And um, knight b6 has a couple points, which have to do with breaking up the center with c6, covering a4 and c4, and uh, sometimes sacrificing on that square, as we'll see. Okay, so Jim Tarjan, who is playing Shiroff here. Shiroff is white. And by the way, Shiroff has played... <laughs> I don't know how many games I found, 15 games or so as white. 
um, probably more in the Brayer, and he's also played the Brayer as black, and Shiroff is an ultra-aggressive player. So, um, okay, anyway, moving on, white simply develops a piece, he has more space because of d5, and black breaks in the center, and that is pretty much the standard break. Now, remember this whole thing about pawn chains. Here we've got these pawn chains. White hasn't really even considered yet playing c4, c5 against black's pawn chain, or f4 which would attack the front of the pawn chain. Now, there are many games in which white actually does play f4 against the brayer, but this is not one of them. Um, what was my point? Well, my point is with the pawn chain, both sides are looking to attack either the base or the front. And uh, let, me, let me just show you that again without arrows. And attacking the base would involve playing the move f5, and that's a very standard kind of move in the um, against this pawn structure. Here, though, it's not easy to get in because, for one thing, uh, the rook should be behind the pawn break, so it can open a file and can, so it can support f5. For another thing, the uh, the bishop is usually here supporting f5. So even if you even if you sort of set up to play f5, you've got to remember there's one, two, three guys against that square, and there could even be a fourth, for example, here, or maybe the queen could come up. So it's going to be very hard to get f5 in anyway. Uh, here, pretty much impossible. The other thing is it's often better in modern chess, people attack the front of the pawn chain a lot. And here's a case where attacking the front of the pawn chain is very handy because it tends to activate black's bishop, which is sort of stuck. It gives it a roll. It also activates black's rook. Black played the move rook c8 with the idea of playing c6, and that is indeed what he plays now. So if he can play c takes d, or even if white takes, either way, black has a rook on an open file, which, by the way, white doesn't at this point. Um, so that's sort of the idea here. And white has set up so that he could play c4 to stop that from opening up. If he plays this move, he's actually probably, well, he might even be worse already. He probably is, because after either rook takes, attacking this, or even bishop takes, there's this problem that, that, that well, bishop takes a problem because that one's hanging, right? Excuse me. But, but in principle, that bishop is indirectly attacking that e pawn. It's not so much the e pawn, it's the d5 square. Black's ready to play knight b6, and then play d5. And d5 is black's big break. He has a two to one central majority. If he can get d5 in, he'll probably stand better. So this position may already be better for black. It's certainly okay for black. Um, so white wants to avoid that. White, white wants to strengthen his center. Now if black takes this, he's just gonna take back. And this bishop is still stuck behind these pawns. It's a very passive piece, even though it's the good bishop in theory for black. So black has a bad bishop here and not a very good bishop on b7 either. Um, whereas white can play things like a4 and bishop d3, and he'll have two good bishops, two bishops that are doing good things. So it, often looking at the minor pieces is very important in chess to compare who's got a good position, who has a bad one. Here I prefer white, even though black has a nice open file. Um, but let's see what happens. Black instead plays that move. Very interesting, very flexible attacking this for a second time. Usually blacks have played knight, in the old days, black would play knight b6 earlier, but as I mentioned, but it's useful to keep the, the knight on first and have black white commit to c4 first. Okay, so white has to defend that c4 square, and he's not gonna, he's not gonna start exchanging these pawns because that opens up all of black's pieces. He's gonna hold on to that pawn structure. If he can hold it, this is an advantage. Any space advantage like this is a plus. It's just a question of can those pawns be attacked? and is white creating weaknesses by advancing his pawns. Okay, so now black takes, and he has, as I say, this bad piece here. Sure, he's got a file, but on the other hand, white's got a better center, and black's, black's um, bishops really don't look that great. So white, black takes there, and that's the point. Here, that's, I, should have, I should have had you pause for a second. But how is black gonna solve this problem? Within a couple of moves, white's gonna play a4, white can play bishop d3, white can start attacking on the queen side, and he's just gonna have the better game. Well, the way that Black met this, the way Jim Tarjan played, is the way Spassky maybe first played even, or at least I remember Spassky's games from when I was a kid. He may have been the first one to do this, or at least a very early one to do this. Win two pawns in the center, and there are two, two central pawns advancing can be a very powerful thing. Now, he's a whole piece down, so that's a problem. But now, White's pieces all of a sudden don't look that great. This one's kind of under attack. This one's capable of being exchanged. And as I say, those, those pawns are going to advance quickly. Also, white, black has the only open file. So let's see how this works. 
Um, but you asked if Black can play aggressively in the brayer, and look, here, here's, here's a good way to play aggressively. He wins a third pawn for his piece. Three pawns is usually enough for a piece. On the other hand, White's much happier than he was a second ago because he has, he has attacking ideas on the king's side. He's gained a little time to get his pieces out, and these pawns haven't started advancing yet. So it's a little unclear what's going on here. White has attacking chances. Okay, Black goes back to that square. Now White's ready to launch into his attack. He's going to get rid of the defender here. And he's going to start uh, moving his pieces over to the king's side. This knight could be sacrificed on a square like that at some point. That's that's a danger. Uh, H4, H5 could really loosen up the king's side and start attacking over there. This bishop has an open open line to the king's side. When the pawns were here, it was blocked. It was blocked off. So it's a very complicated position. Black wants to just move his center pawns forward and win the game. White wants to attack on the king's side and stop the center pawns from moving forward. Okay, so black preserves this bishop. One reason he preserves that bishop is to defend these weakened dark squares, but it's also to protect e5 so he can play so that he can play d5 without losing his e pawn. Okay, white comes back. Excellent move. He's going to play knight up, and he might even be able to play f4 now that the knight's out of the way to attack the center. But knight g4 is the main idea to attack these weak um, dark squares. When you have an extra piece, it's nice to use those minor pieces in the attack, and that's what he's doing. Okay, black anchors this down. I don't think objectively that was the best move, but we're not going to worry about technicalities. It's a good move. He probably should have played d5 right away. Just move those pawns as fast as possible. White plays a natural move. And now this is interesting, because according to the computer, white has a tiny advantage. It's very, very difficult. And he should play this move. Well, that's an awfully sophisticated move. It's not the first one that would occur to me. It loosens this square... But just the fact that it restrains the move e4 justifies it, basically. And then supposedly white's a tiny bit better. But but black, by playing this line, has a very aggressive position. And in practice, I don't think black would be unhappy to have this position. He still has, he has ideas of f5 followed by e4 followed by d4. Um, in practice, I think black's going to win a lot of games from this position. In theory, sure, a, a very strong player might might be somewhat better for white. But uh, if that's the case, Black's opening has been pretty successful. If you have to play a move like f3, it's not a good sign for um, for White, even if it is a good move. So instead he plays f4, more typical Sheroff, but really more typical any top player. They, they're trying to break through. They want, they want Black to take and for White to take and have more pressure on this square and have sacrifices threatened all over the king's side. And, um, it makes total sense to play that move. But it turns out that this position is not so easy to break through. I think White was counting on this move f5. He kind of has to count on that because Black could uh, strengthen his center with f5 and maybe even win material over there since that bishop's trapped. So f5 is a big threat, so White's going to play f5. Okay, so now, you know, the pieces are coming to the king side. So it looks like an attack. But look at Black's past pawns in the center. They're extremely scary, and in fact, he plays d4. Okay, so what have we got here? A wonderful double-edged position between two grandmasters. And, you know, they've played a wonderful, wonderful game so far already. And now it gets even more complicated. Uh, White plays there. He's got to keep things moving. And once the queen moves, he wants to get in on these squares. Uh, knight, H, knight h6 check can be a big check because the king has to move. And then we have these things like rook f1 attacking this way. This is a really fun game. Okay, black played there. It turns out, I think that's a mistake. It's actually a fairly serious mistake. It turns out that black was better if he played this move, even though it cuts off his own bishop, um, because everything else is going well. If he can block off the king's side attack, it turns out his other pieces are so strong, with d3, maybe e3, maybe queen coming to d4 or d5. Uh, things are so good for black that he can afford to have one bad piece, is what it amounts to. And he gains time. He needs time. So that would have been a good move. Another good move would be queen b6. That may even be the best move. Um, and after, he was probably afraid of check. And here, this looks really good at first sight because, you know, the, there's an attack on the king's side. But this d3 check move is coming too fast. Um, so black's better here. Black's also better, supposedly, at least after um, this move. Now, these are complicated positions, and who knows who would actually win a real game. But... Um, but uh, queen b6 is a good move. f6 was the best of all these moves and would give black a uh, small advantage, but a definite advantage, according to the computer. Uh, not, a, not a clear, not actually definite's a funny word, not 
maybe maybe just a, a what would be called a slight advantage in the in the chess world if he plays perfectly. So it's not as though Shiroff has totally misplayed this. Anyway, that move is so tempting because it indirectly attacks here. It centralizes the queen. You always want to centralize. It protects e4. Um, it just looks like a great move, but it's on a funny square. One way to look at it, of course, is there might be a knight f6 check at some point, and that queen would be forked. You know, it's a family fork square. <laughs> on the other hand, who you know, who could have known that in advance? Very messy. Um, the real problem with it is not in principle. It's not. It's not anything. It's just very concrete tactically. Uh, Shiroff is, you know, one of the great tacticians of our time and has been so for many, many years. I don't know if anybody knows, but he won a qualifying match for the World Championship with Vladimir Kramnik. And at the time, he was number three in the world, moving up to number two. And uh, he was, so he qualified to play Garry Kasparov in a World Championship match. And uh, they couldn't find a venue and enough money to play, supposedly. Now, Kasparov can always find money to play, in my opinion. I sure off well i'm not going to get into it but i i tend to think sure was kind of cheated and should have had a chance to play for the world championship well he earned it he earned a chance to play for the world championship and it was kasparov's organization so kasparov really was responsible for finding a place to play and uh it's more complicated than that it's true uh, I, I could go into a lot of detail there was a point where they could have played and Sheroff actually didn't like the conditions for where uh, under which he would have to play, but um, so you know you can argue it various ways. But um, anyway, he's a wonderful, wonderful attacking player, and indeed Jim fell into this attack, which really looks kind of silly. It's amazing that this move works at all. Um, but here's here's why it works: is because after that, and here just captures multiple times. And the reason this works is because the pawn on b4 is hanging. That is not something you see naturally or normally. Uh, in other words, after this move, what we get is we get, well, there's different ways to do it, but the best way of all to do it is play rook here first, cutting cutting off, guess what, the king from getting over here. And after the queen moves, it can't move to a dark square. So maybe it moves here, and then you have this knight h6 check move. You have an even be more beautiful move here, which Shiroff would have found in an instant, which is this check. Giving up the rook, then this check. Now, if king up, it doesn't help, because check. You have to go to f8 eventually. So whether you go there immediately or not is not that important. You eventually have to go here, and then this amazing, stupid little move, and there's no way to, to stop checkmate. So, you know, it's really a beautiful combination. It's not the kind of thing human beings like you or me would normally see. Um, but because it's too weird, you're not really looking at that square. And, and um, at any rate, uh, maybe with enough time we'd find it, and maybe with enough time Jim would have seen it in advance. But you know, by now they're in such complications that that he didn't he didn't see this. So what actually happens here? Jim did something else and kept playing, but it didn't really it didn't really matter. Uh, very, well, now it's all over. This is attacked, and. Uh, he takes that way. He can take with the rook too, and uh, Jim resigns because the king's too exposed. This is this is just all over. Wonderful game, and um, and shows some of Black's potential <laughs> for her aggression. And there are so many wonderful games with Black uh, aggressing in the brayer that I think you're going to be okay. Now, one question might be: with current theory, if White plays certain lines, are you going to be able to get an aggressive position? My impression, just glancing over stuff, and I have to admit, I don't know for sure, because these very top 2,800 players may know how to keep everything under control so well that white can get a little pressure and black doesn't have any counterplay. I don't see that happening. It doesn't seem to be happening. It seems like black always has decent options, and the brayer is doing quite well. Okay, that was a long one. We do that, don't we? We get off off the uh, off. Uh, subject a little bit, or we t I end up taking too much time, but I hope you enjoyed that game. I thought it was a beautiful game and shows how how wonderful that, not just that opening, but these players are. All right. Um, let me see if I have any new chat questions. Uh, no, 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 no. The game lasted 20 minutes and I didn't win a single game. Uh after that, I drew a few. It was the first game. Anyway, fun. Anyway, um, asking us a question after telling us the answer is really unique. <laughs> well, <laughs> sorry about that. I'm not. I, I can believe. There you go. It's a trick. <laughs> Just trying to see. 
Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Actually, there are times when I sort of rush ahead and think, "Gee, I wish I'd, I wish I'd slow down and and sh asked everybody what was going on first. All right, what are we doing here? We're. Um, let me show you the next game or the next question. Also from last week, I think. Oh, here's a question from Colin McCaffrey, who sent me two very good questions. He says, I have a question about the 4A3 QID line. Let me show you what that is. Um, EX percentage 55. All right, this is what the Queen's Indian, when he says QID, that's the Queen's Indian defense. This is the Queen's Indian. Now remember, that's the famous Nimzo Indian there. So white often tries to avoid that by playing this move. And then if black wants to, he can play this move, and that's called the Queen's Indian Defense, which is what Nimzovich himself played. And great players have played for many, many years and are still playing all the time. Um, a lot of you grew up with Karpov, who was a big Queen's Indian uh, player. But actually, for a while, there just about everybody in the world was a Queen's Indian player. So I don't know uh, if I need to limit it to him. Um, well, that's the question. Okay, I know that this line, it's this this move, a3, which looks really silly, but prevents bishop b4, and, and is, has some other good points, but its main point is to prevent bishop b4, get your knight here. The problem is, if you play other moves, you have a hard time getting the knight there. If you play the knight there, immediately it gets pinned, and people who play knight f3 don't really want to play basically what's a Nimzo Indian. And how else do you get your pieces out? If you play this move, what happens eventually is there's usually a bishop b4 check move, um, you could even do it right away. And the point is, is the knight doesn't really want to go here. It wants to go here, where it really controls these critical central squares. You know, there's a big battle over e4 and d5. So one way to get the knight to c3 is just brute force. Just say, well, I'm white, so I can afford one slow move, just to get my piece on an ideal square. And I played this for years and years as white. In fact, I had some really pretty wins. I was tempted to show you one of my pretty wins, but then I thought, that's not really what I'm being asked, so I shouldn't do that. Um, as he says, as I understand it, he used to secure relatively safe positions without the counterplay caused by bishop b4. However, then Kasparov, that's Petrosian. Uh, this line used to be played by Petrosian, he said. However, then Kasparov came along and implemented a, di a different approach where he used a3 to cook off some really enterprising, aggressive chess. Two of the most famous games from the Kaspar early Kasparov era were from these Queen's Indian lines. Beautiful games. I was hoping you could go over the difference in approach, how Kasparov changed the feel of the opening. Additionally, does anybody use uh, the approach by Petrosian in modern chess, or has it been left behind? Okay, well, unfortunately, you know, I need to get to other questions, and um, so I can't really show you a lot. The, something as sweeping as how Kasparov changed the feel of the opening and all of that, but I did want to say it's a great question because I think you're exactly right. Petrosian played it and usually got just sort of moderate, solid, sometimes just very equal games that he could play so well. He, Petrosian was very much like Carlson in that respect. He would just get a game, and as long as it was double-edged, and as long as there were plenty of pieces left on the board, um, he would outplay his opponent. Kasparov came by, and he played the move a3 with the idea of wiping out his opponent, which I thought was wonderful, so I played it myself. Somehow with less success, although actually I did pretty well with it, but I, I thought I'd show you one of my games to show you the Maybe it's the Kasparov approach, but also show you why it is that it's not as popular these days, uh, either by either with the Petrosian. The thing is, you can't really get the Petrosian positions without making some concessions. Uh, so black has dynamic ways of playing that are discouraging. Um, now, just for the record, the main line, and still played all the time, is this. And white hasn't really solved this position uh, here. Um, and... Um, Probably the main line is queen c2. Uh, the early days, Kasparov would play this move. And actually, some of these lines are kind of fun. I mean, for example, this... Oh, I'm sorry. Did I do that right? Um, yeah, sometimes they play knight d7 first. And um, what was the thing I was going to show you, though? Oh, I was going to show you g6. Uh, um, of course, you know, I came up with this move. And a lot of people still play this. And, and white got a little discouraged against this. But I think you can still get fascinating games. I think Kasparov played this in the, one of the very original games with this line. And I think if you look at this carefully, you'll see that white can get better play than Kasparov did in that, in that game. Um, so, you know, I think it still might be fun to play for white, these lines. But, of course, there's also the main line, which is, uh, well, you can just play bishop e7. But there's also... 
Um, so the main lines, I guess, Black thinks he's pretty much okay. So White started playing either this move, which went out of fashion after a while. It's a little bit slow. Or this move, which is actually quite aggressive. And what happened is that Black, over time, ended up getting pretty decent games out of this, this main line here. Um, we go something like this, and maybe this, and maybe this, and castles, and this kind of thing. And White would play, for example, and I don't want to get this wrong. Um, my brilliant memory coming through again. You can just play bishop b2. Well, let's just do that for a second. Let's, let's play bishop b2. You can play rook d1 too. I'm trying to remember how all this goes. Uh, and black would play here, and white would sneak back here usually. And this um, this kind of position turned out to be, at least most people think this is just fine for black. So that discouraged white, because it's hard, it's hard to figure out how to put your pieces in good, strong attacking positions once you've gotten to a position sort of more or less like this, or this even. And so, and so this has become less popular for white to play just because it's equal. The other discouraging thing is what happened in this game. This line is still pretty good for black, I think. I've never been able to improve on this. Um, and it was played by a ton of very good players. It's that move. And we talked about this a few weeks ago, this exact position we talked about. I, I used it as my first example of bishop a6 in a queen's Indian. And I tried to explain why it is that White thinks he has to play that move, Queen C2, which is what I played. I was White in this game against Walter Brown, who was U.S. champion six times and a you know really strong international player at one point, one of the well leading player in the world actually, um, one of the leading players, not not top five, but way up there. Um, what's my point here? Oh yeah, and I tried to explain the other day why why, and you might want to go back to this uh, to see why it is that moves like B3 and Knight D2 and Queen a4 are not particularly desirable here, but this pawn is attacked, and e3 is is weird too because then you're um, you aren't going to get your bishop on the long diagonal, and you've stopped any chance of getting e4 in. So, so I played queen c2. This was a fairly new theory at the time, and I played there. Now this looks just good. What what on earth is Black doing? He's wasted a whole tempo. And white got the move he wanted to get in, and guess what? I got e4 coming. Isn't this wonderful? But the problem with playing queen c2, as I mentioned the other day, is that after c5, uh, the queen's not behind that anymore. If, if you could move your queen back and get one extra free move in, you could play d5, and you'd have a wonderful game because you're blocking off that bishop, and you're going to follow it with e4. And that's a, just a wonderful game. But with the queen on c2, you can't do that without losing a pawn. He just takes twice, and it turns out that these various checks and things just don't do any good. For example, this looks like it wins a piece, but it doesn't because of that. So so then you're stuck with finding a secondary plan, and since I was playing the Kasparov way of playing the Queen's Indian, you know, <laughs> maybe if I played it today, I'd just play that, which is a safe, fairly equal move. It's, it's messy, but it's probably about equal. It's, it's very, very complicated, but it also cuts off your bishop. It's not an attacking move. It's a positional move. Um, I played the move that was, you know, thought to be best at the time, I guess. I didn't know the theory well enough. I was fairly new to d4 when I was playing this stuff. And, um, because I used to play C, e4 and c4 for years. I wasn't much of a d4 player. I played here, and Brown played this move. Now, later I found, I mean, as time went on, not just me, but I was not happy after that move attacking the knight. It looks great for white because if black retreats, you know, you have a big space advantage, maybe bishop f4 or something, put a rook on d1. You know, maybe maybe black's almost equal, but it's fun to play for white. The problem is, is that black can give up the bishop pair. Now, usually it's bad to give up the bishop pair early in the game. But this position is actually okay for black, and it's even not a kind of position I wanted to play for white. Knight d4 is a big move, so usually... White's going to play here, and Black could even play knight d4 anyway. But I think I think you you know you, you just move the queen, and so Black should probably play here. And just to show you, now knight g4 is an idea. So Black's probably White's going to play here to stop knight g4. Black's probably going to castle. White's going to castle, and now maybe just throw that move knight d4 in anyway. I think is a good move. And you know White can't take it because after the knight moves, then this pawn will be hanging twice. So white has to retreat. And then there's this kind of clever move. Just play e5, giving up d5, but really securing d4. And the knights are actually better than the bishops in some way here, partly for sort of tactical reasons. But this is this is not an ideal position. Um, 
it turns out a3 is, a, is kind of weakening now because it's on the b file and um, and that b3 square is weak so I'm just saying black's much better. It's pro probably still roughly equal, but it's not something I wanted to play. Just to show you some strategic ideas, how these things work. Giving up the bishop pair is something a really strong player can do, and a weaker player against a stronger player will usually get punished for it, but it tends to work here. So that's another reason I gave up a3 on the fourth move for white, is because of this line. I wanted to play this whole line for white, but I, I thought that was a good move. Now, it turns out this one's pretty good, too. And uh, Brown knew it much better than I did. That was one problem. I used up a lot of time on the opening. It turned out I played a lot of um, good moves that were later main moves, but I didn't really know what I was doing. Okay, I wanted to stop knight h5. I thought if I castled queenside, he would play knight h5, and I wouldn't know, know where to go. I mean, you can always go here, but it, these positions tend to be... The, later on, he plays on the c file. It tends to be just equal, but not much fun for white. So I want to go the other way. So I played here. And he castled. And this position, it turns out, it was played a lot of times. Um, I don't think I even knew that this position existed at the time. I certainly didn't know what happened next. He played this, which turned out to be the main move by far. And I played um, because of e5 happening, basically. For example, if he takes here, uh, you play here, and the knight has to move. And it can't go to any other square, so it has to go there. And then you play bishop here, and you're threatening h7. And guess what? You're also threatening f2. So you have a really nice advantage here. You've got an attack on the king's side. So at least I saw that, but what I didn't realize... Okay, so after that, he really is threatening bishop takes. And I looked at a lot of ways to defend it, and I didn't really like any of them. I didn't like any options here, really. I looked at ways of attacking, and I didn't like those very much. So finally, I decided I could just play there. And I, that is indeed the move that was discovered later. It's the best move. But I, you know, I was worried about f5, f4 ideas. And I remember this game. I just took too long. Brown plays a nice move. If you take now, there's a check with an attack on the bishop, and then there's a check, and then I'm losing some key squares in the center. Now, this may even be better for white. It's it's complicated, um, but I didn't like the looks of it, especially positionally I didn't like it, because, you know, this knight's going to come into these squares over here, and I've still got problems on the C file, and I didn't see my king. I thought my king side attack had disappeared. Uh, it turns out this is equal or... If any, you know, maybe White even could play for the most minuscule advantage of all time, but I didn't like the looks of it. I also trusted him. Okay, so now I'm threatening to take this because there's no queen g5 check. He plays here, uh, defending it, and it turns out this is all book. Uh, I played that move, which is probably not that great a move. I thought it was so clever. Um, maybe something more solid. But I think I think the point is, is, is that um, Black's okay now. Black's fine here. He's got his knight can come back into play aggressively. He's got rook c8. It's, he has no major, major problems. I played it, tried to play it tactically like I always do, trying to just take this guy. And after he takes, I realized he had some pressure on the c file, but I liked the fact that I had two bishops. You know, and maybe I can even get a bishop on that diagonal. And maybe I can play f4. And then I had one more idea in mind that turned out to be a pretty good one. It's to play uh, exchange sacrifice, but uh, my timing wasn't so great. I don't know how much theory Brown knew. I suspect he nah, he may have prepared this. He was awfully well prepared. I played there. I think later on it turned out it wasn't the greatest move. But my idea is to play rook takes and have two bishop a pawn for the exchange and the bishop pair. And I also wanted to hit a7, but he very smartly just ignored me, counterattacking here. And I pinned it because I didn't want to play passively. I think this is just too passive. I need the move f4 to undermine the center. So I pinned it. And all these were good moves, but they just took me to it. He made a very brave move, an excellent move, typical Walter Brown. He didn't, no compromise. Really good move. Otherwise, I think he really was worse in this position. But that's an excellent counterattacking move in the center. Notice that if he can take this, he's also defending his bishop again. So he's got, got more things to do. He also gets rid of his backward pawn. And... Um, it's just an excellent move. So and so it doesn't look like an excellent move at first because um, because you're going to take that at some point. I counterattacked immediately with f4. I think that's a good move, um, getting in my usual time pressure. Um, it turns out he sh maybe maybe this is just a better move, believe it or not. But it's not easy to play. You're trying to play an aggressive attacking game, 
and instead you, you're playing these kind of you play a slow move like that especially against walter brown an attacking player it's just hard to do it's probably objectively best i'm to try to break things down he plays that another exclamation point move he put this in his best games actually his book of his favorite games um and uh, <laughs> i have to admit he kept surprising me that was a surprise move too um i played now i played here um I think he, he actually kind of liked that move. He thought it was a reasonable move, but it's objectively not best. Objectively, I should play takes and then just take here. And he can play slowly now because that thing's not going anywhere, but, but it's an even game. And um, instead, I went for, went for the gusto, and he played as I expected. Now I'm threatening to win a whole piece, which would be just winning the game. So he played as I expected. He counterattacks here. If I take that, he takes here, and he has a great game. And um, I had expected that, but I was playing for this move. Now, now I have a pawn for the exchange, like I said I wanted. And I thought I had a pretty good attack. I've got the idea of taking here with two pass pawns on the queen side. Uh, but he played here with the outpost. Um, that didn't really worry me. I think at this point I started realizing, though, that I hadn't calculated properly, or that I had I just overestimated this position. I, I played, um, let me see. Sorry, I wanted to see if there was a note here. Whoa, something's wrong here. Where's my note here? Anyway, I took the second pawn and got my past pawns, and he played here. Um, thinking about coming here in some lines, also just leaving himself free to um, connect rooks. That's the main idea, is to connect rooks. I played there to stop this move, also kind of discourage that move. I don't remember what else I was doing, but I was doing something. He doubled. Um, I got out of the way. The funny thing is the computer says these are all best moves. It's amazing. Uh, I, I think that's a coincidence more than anything else. For some reason, that, that's the only move that the, the computer says equalizes. And here... Um, I just thought I could play a variety of moves, and it turned out I really couldn't. I ended up playing the best move, which is that. Hard to say. It defends this. It's hard to describe this exactly, but if he takes it, of course, I have a kingside attack. But if he doesn't take it, I'm really ready to start moving these pawns. These are very dangerous pawns. And um, so he does play that move, which is the best move. He's trying to drive me away where he can win key pawns like these with tempo. If he can get that g2 pawn, he's not only attacking my rook, but he's attacking my king. And I play here. Turns out that's the most accurate move. I couldn't believe it. Um, and uh, let me see. He plays there. And I take. Uh, yeah, so knight g3 was actually a mistake. But we're both getting in. Oh, Brown was always in time trouble, by the way. But I seem to have matched him in this game. Very bad idea. He's a brilliant time trouble player. And I'm one of the worst ever. Um, so I'm actually probably winning here. <laughs> but I played... Uh, I played inaccurately. I should, um, I would, I should simply play here. But I just didn't see. I thought he had such a counterattack here, and this check wouldn't mean anything. But it turns out this check is extremely strong, and uh, I won't go into the details there. But it all, it all works out. Um, how does this go? I was afraid of uh, him getting this kind of thing going. Oh yeah, I remember now. I was afraid of Queen E1. And rook c1. And it just turns out I get to his king faster than he gets to mine. But I need some weird little trick, and I didn't see it. So so he, so he, I played this, which turns out to be just a losing move. I was in a lot of time trouble. If he had to move the rook, I'd be winning, but he just plays there. I was like, whoops. <laughs> I messed that one up. Because if I play here now, he plays here, and he checkmates me. Simple, right? But I was panicking, I think, or something. And I have to play here, therefore, but unfortunately, he's still threatening checkmate. And I don't know. I think things get worse and worse. I have to take with the king. And he plays that nice move, just a, what looks like a, a defensive move. But in fact, he's in one material, and, and he's um, threatening this, and he's threatening that. And all of a sudden, I've run out of moves. So I, this doesn't last very long. Or now he's mating me. There we go. And now queen b5, and... Queen b3 and rook a8 and all these things are made threats. So it was kind of a fun game. It was an interesting game. But uh, um, and what does it say about a3? 
It discouraged me because I think if you look earlier at this, black was always at least equal in the opening, maybe even better. And white's taking a chance by castling queenside. It's easy to get in trouble when you castle queenside. So even though at one point I, I had a great game and I was doing great, um, I had to use up all my time just trying to get out of the opening, basically. And, and in the end, uh, I got alienated but by this line in general. There were just too many answers that seemed to be pretty reasonable. All right, so what do we have? Um, can you show your pretty win next week? <laughs> oh, yeah, good idea. <laughs> okay, nine exclamps. Um, oh, bishop e7 doesn't work, I don't think. I, uh, yeah, good point. Uh, that's what I intended, of course, I think, originally. I was looking at this game right before the show, actually, just before the show to see if I should show it. And I remember looking at that bishop e7. Where would that have been? Uh, um, I don't know, maybe roughly around here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it looks good, doesn't it? But uh, I think knight f2. Oh, d3. Yes, yes, d3. Yeah, and I saw this at the last minute. Typical Brown. He probably saw it six moves ago. <laughs> it's just awful. I, I, th th this position is much worse than it looks. I mean, you might say, well, I have my choice of rooks, but it just doesn't really matter. Um, I don't know if you remember we looked at it after the game. I mean, maybe a line like this white can survive, but uh, he's not better anymore for sure. I think black's better. And uh, I looked at it right before the game, and I put the engine on. I don't remember what it said. I think it just said if white plays perfectly, he's slightly better, but but um, but he has to play perfectly. So, I mean, I'm a black slightly better. Yeah, so, so I saw that and tried to do the queen b6 instead. I assume that's the bishop b7 you were talking about. Okay, um, Sifo, oh, he did it again, and the event played in Norway, yeah. Uh, Tomek asked me last week, and I wasn't actually going to answer it this week, I was going to wait another week, I told you I get too many questions. Um, he, he asked me about this advanced variation, whether he should play the move c5. You know, Yermolinsky on ICC, if you're an ICC member, uh, I think he gave a multi-part lecture on this, uh, the c5 move, which he plays, played for years, I and mean, I know he played it against... Um, in the uh, zone of the FIDE World Championship match against um, Kinderman, and he actually lost, but he, he, he um, has defended this and shows how to play it. Um, I used to think you could play something really clever against this involving transposing to a sort of an advanced French with Queen G4 or something, but um, the normal move, by the way, is this, I should say. It's hard to, it's hard to do anything else because at this point, because you're, you're getting a French where this bishop is going to come out in front of the pawn chain if you aren't careful. I mean, for example, you really don't want something like probably this, I think. Don't guarantee that's true. But um, maybe 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 you could play something else first. Yeah, no, probably this. I mean, most people don't want to play this line. It's, it's an advance, especially if white plays slowly. He wouldn't. White would take this. But if he plays slowly, you have a standard advance French with the bishop out in front of this pawn chain, and that, that's almost got to be okay for okay or better for black. Um, so to avoid that, what white does is he takes. He says, hey, you've moved that pawn twice. I'll clear out the center. I'll win the d4 square, and I'll just play chess. And uh, I know in Huska's book, she recommends playing this, and I spent a lot of time looking at these moves. And a lot of people still play this. Other people have decided you don't have to play that way. You can play, I guess, knight c6 first. I'm sorry. Uh, what's my memory here? It's knight c6 first, and then see what white does, because white's traditional s setup here has been to put his bishop here and a pawn here, maybe even bishop d4 sometimes. So by playing knight c6 first, I guess you try to get him to commit to not playing f4. You try to get him to commit to playing that first. And now, by the way, bishop g4 probably isn't so good, and it's for some tricky reason that I can't remember. Or maybe it is good. Maybe it's a reasonable move. Oh, maybe he hangs onto his pawn. Yeah, I think maybe something like this. And you got to be really careful that after bishop d3 and b4, suddenly that pawn is protected. Anyway, those are details. But uh, yes, you can play c5, and people are playing it uh, fairly often. And uh, I'm glad to hear it was played in Norway. Who played it? You might want to say who played it. Um, yeah, Colin also asked about the symmetrical endgame thing. That that you've asked before, I mean, I'll try to get to that. It's kind of a broad, broad question. He's, he's asking, what about when you get to the endgame and you've got these three against these three, 
and these three against these three, which, by the way, doesn't happen that often <laughs> because usually there's more pawns taken off by the time you get to the end game. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's a great question, and there's a lot to be said about those endings, but I think I need to... Um, it's a, it'd be a huge answer. I'll try and take one more look at it, Colin, uh, and, and try and prepare something or other. But Vinik Tall, three games. There you go. That's right. Black gave it up after a bad loss. I think the current theory is that Black's okay, but, um, you know, needs to know what he's doing. So what, what uh, John Thomas is saying is, is that in the Botvinnik Tall match, this happened. Oh, actually, Tall would be white in this line. And then uh, Tall switched to Botvinnik, sorry, Botvinnik switched to back to the normal line against Tall. The Karakan was an inspired choice by Botvinnik because um, Tal was sort of uncomfortable. Now he played it in the first match, and and uh, Tal played this the one ingenious famous game where he allows doubled f pawns. And but I think just with some care, uh, it's it's an opening that you can't really get tremendous attacking chances against. And that's what Botvinnik counted on was Tal's predilection for tremendous for big attacking games. Um, what do you think about Huska's book? Seems nice from this lowly perspective. I always liked Huska's book a lot. I think some of the lines have gone a little out of date, um, and so people are using other lines. And there's there's been a bunch of stuff since then also. There's another, who's the Karakan book? Uh, well, Dreyev writes a lot about the Karakan. I can't remember if he has a whole book on it. He has DVDs on it. Somebody else might want to might wanna pitch in here. I liked Huska's book. It was really instructive and, and uh, just just fun. I had her on the interview show for ICC. You can go back and listen to that interview. Um, what was I going to say about the book? Oh, one good thing it did is it showed all those wonderful B5 ideas, which Petrosian used to play, actually. Um, positional pawn sacrifices to get the light squares on the queen side. You could just you could get that book just for that reason alone, and those examples alone, and you would understand so much more about what the Carol can is about or how much fun it can be. Uh, if you if you just looked at those chapters. So basically, I'm very positive about it. I think the specific lines aren't working as well. You know, her whole main line with castles, king side instead of queen side, um, is still being played, but it's being played, I think, with a different order. I think some of the lines she recommended got, got into some trouble. But she does recommend the C5 line, absolutely, against the uh, advance. Great questions. Uh, any favorite game collection. There is only one game collection of Walter Brown. He wrote it himself, and it's an absolutely terrific book. It's one of, the, one of the better games collection. It's funny, you know, you really can't just go by rating or world class, you know, world reputation. Or Now, you should like attacking chess, probably. Complex chess. Although he has some positional masterpieces in there, but he mostly has. It's just, Walter played interesting chess. He just played very interesting chess, and I always thought he should put together a games collection, and he finally did. And, um, I don't think you can go wrong with it. It's just called, I don't know what it's called. Oh, uh, yeah, I do. Stress, stress of chess. It's called the stress of chess. And you know, he was always under stress, so it was a good, a good title. Um, yeah, I, I can't, I can't say. If you love attacking chess, especially, you, you would have a great time with that, that, uh, that one. Okay, let's see if we can get to some prepared questions here. Let me think. Uh, oh, games from the viewers. Um, Gerben Van. Hell sent me a game. Now I have, actually all of a sudden I have, especially given the old ones, too many games from viewers, but that's fine. We're going to get through them. So you just got to be patient. I probably won't show them all, but I'll show an awful lot of them. So if you don't see them in the first couple of weeks after you send them, don't worry. Just keep sending them. <laughs> keep sending new ones and I'll, I'll, I'll get there, especially the ones I think are interesting. Gerben Van Pell says, I play for a very small club in the village in the Netherlands. It has 20 senior members and 30 kids. Now, in the Netherlands, we have a system for training called the Steppen Method, Step Method. This method teaches only tactics. I didn't know it was quite, that was quite true, but, but um, I know John Hartman wrote a review of the Step Method. I think there's six volumes, or five volumes, maybe five volumes, uh, uh, and they're translated into English, too. And uh, he was teaching it to, with his kids. I think it's a really fun, interesting system. I don't know that much about it. I haven't used it myself. He says, Gerben says, just so you guys know about this, step one is mostly checkmate in one or two, pins and double attack, and it goes to six. Okay, so it goes to six, where it's pretty deep things like good versus bad bishop. We also teach them the golden opening rules and some very basic openings. We tell them to learn openings at home because it takes a lot of time. The result of this is we have guys who are good in tactics but are very bad at openings slash positional play. 
How do you feel about this? Is this good or bad? And do you know a fast and effective way to train openings? Well, the last part, do you know a fast or effective way to train openings? I can answer easily, no. <laughs> there is no fast or effective way. Um, it's, it's a long it's a long process, but it's really a lifelong process. I mean, you could argue that the, the 2,800 and above people are learning how to play openings at this, at this moment. Um, because openings, you know, it's the pieces, there are more pieces on the board during the openings than any other time. There's more variables, there's more. That's why computers without books have always struggled the most, actually, in the opening. Uh, they have more trouble in the opening or than they do in complex middle games or endings because the horizon is so enormous and there are so many subtleties. But of course they have the books to go by too, to use, and that really helps. Um, he said, oh, I'm sorry, there's more of a question here. He says, I'm 22 and a product of this system. I know my openings are bad, but because nobody else in the club plays openings, nobody learns. They play things like the Alapin or sometimes even one night C3 and they just eyeball it. And then he sends this game. So I guess, let me see, how do I feel about the Steppen method? I've heard um, my friend John Hartman, who writes the reviews for Chess Life, reviewed it and thought uh, it was very interesting. As I say, he uses it himself. Um, it's, got a, it's got a good reputation. I didn't know what you said about it, uh, that, that it neglected openings completely and wasn't good at positional play. I'm not, not sure. I guess I feel that most people learn a lot of their positional rules and their 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 sense of back and forth in chess from the openings. I assume it teaches a bunch of endgames. I mean, everybody has to know basic endgames, so I'm assuming you're getting that in there. Um, so I can't make a judgment because I haven't really looked at it. I, I gather there's some really good things about it. I think teaching the so-called golden opening rules probably doesn't help too much because most of those rules are sort of failing anything else do this meaning that if you if you don't know what's going on in the opening you're, you're on move nine or ten or something and and you're completely in unknown territory just make sure or even move five or six get your pieces out develop and pay attention to the center and don't move a bunch of flank pawns and don't move pieces two or three or four times. Those are great rules and they're probably the best thing to do if you don't know what's what, what's going on in an opening. But even in some of the classic standard openings, you find out more subtle things about how to play them and what you want to do if you actually play the openings. I think experience is the way to go. So experience and study are the way to go with openings. The, the, you, learning a bunch of general rules about occupy the center and get your pieces out has its limitations. It, it's more of a, it's still useful later, but it's only useful when you've kind of run out of ideas. If you run out of ideas, maybe maybe think in terms of, uh, well, if nothing else, let me keep my king safe and get my pieces out. Um, so, so it's a good backup kind of general rule. But if you're learning openings, uh, you're going to find that most openings follow those rules anyway to the mo to to a large extent and when they don't there's some great reasons for it that are going to be very instructive for you so you're you're better off studying openings and playing them a lot um than you are going by any sort of rules but um huh. so what am i trying to say folks um i guess i'm saying i don't know about the stepping method but i've heard good things about it oh and here's the game okay let's do the game how are we doing for time here oh gee well, I spent a long time on my game against Brown, I guess. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Brown was a fantastic player and uh, played fun games like that. He always, he always we, we played some great games. I beat him a couple times. It turned out my record against him I looked at afterwards, it was pretty bad. But um, I beat him in positional games as it turned out. I don't think I ever beat him in a tactical game. But a couple English openings and one Kings Indian, I actually beat him in. But uh, my overall record was pretty bad. Just very, very strong player. Um, why am I mentioning that? Okay, so this is the game, and I ought to probably talk about it a little bit, shouldn't I? Okay, well, I, I guess I figure the, these moves are just getting pieces out and not doing that much. Let me let me let me start over again, though. Um, this h5 move is kind of crazy. Um, the idea is to play h4 at some point. Uh, I think he mentions that he was watching Simon Williams DVDs where the guy always plays h5, so <laughs> that's reasonable enough, I guess. Um, it's hard to get h4 in, though, I think is the problem, which means that maybe it's not such a great move. But now white should respond, uh, for example, by playing h3 now, 
And then if he takes it and plays his four, you can play g4. And then this pawn is actually a little bit weak. White has space. White has ideas of g5 or bishop g5. And uh, you wouldn't stand that well. The way the game went, let me show you that. He got h4 in. And that's different. Now though, now this rook is going to be active, and it's actually a little hard for white to figure out how to respond to that. White makes a good move. He stops h3, and he wins the bishop pair. But he does so at the cost of weaknesses. Now this is an active piece, and the g3 pawn is kind of weak, and white's probably going to have to go queen side because his king side's really exposed. So I think, I think black has just equalized this game, which he probably shouldn't have done having played h5. Okay, not that important. So let's just keep making moves. Both sides are just getting their pieces out. I think he mentioned that he thought queen a5 was good after black white castled, and he's absolutely right. That's Gerben, uh, because it supports b5, b4, and this can be weak, and uh, it makes a lot of sense. And white played um, uh, d4, which is a funny-looking move because it opens now the c-file. But it uh, frees white's pieces to some extent. It's not, not bad. And that bishop is sort of defending this way. The problem is, is that that's an isolated pawn now. So one way black could play this very simply is just to take this. And then there's a bunch of moves. Uh, you know, probably the easiest is just, just go here. Um, you can also think about putting a knight there very early on. That's going to be a strong idea. Maybe not right away. It's a little early to do that, I guess. So probably here first. But think about this, this kind of maneuver. And white's going to be left with a bad bishop, and black's going to have that beautiful outpost, which is characteristic of the Sicilian defense. And, we, you know, we have a Sicilian defense structure now. So black didn't play that. Black played there, probably to stop queen b5 or knight b5, and maybe support b5, b4, right? Um, not a bad move. And white played this awful move, which makes his bishop even worse and is awfully slow. I mean, white's, white should be doing useful things here. Maybe just get that bishop out of the way. Uh, black plays rook c8, and once again, he could simply just take that and win the dark squares. Let me just repeat that. The, the reason this is good um, is the dark squares. are very. Are, there's no dark square bishop to protect these squares now, and that's an outpost square, so you'll never get rid of a piece there. He can put a knight there, a bishop there, a queen there, a rook there, and, and they're all good pieces. Whereas white doesn't have an outpost like that. Look at Look at the position for a second. Where are White's outposts? He doesn't have one here, anywhere along this rank. See, that's that's the difference. Well, I mean, there could be one there, but you'll never get there. For one thing, you can't support it with that bishop. And this bishop's cut off. So just positionally, this is very good for, for black. Although, because White has more development, it's not the end of the world, but it's just not very good. Now White makes a really poor move because he gets attacked. And now again, you just... You know, take this guy and you have a tremendous game. Um, maybe now this move would be good. It just looks like a good move, but it doesn't really matter. Black's much better. So he plays here. Um, white tries to keep attacking a little bit. Black comes over attacking the queen, which, by the way, is sort of running out of squares. The queen should move here. And I don't remember why that is. Oh, just because where it moved, it was even more exposed, which is here. And that's really an awful move. Uh, one thing is just this move is practically winning. It's just a tremendous move, right? The queen's trapped. So why would have to maybe try this move or something? But this is just awful. I mean, if nothing else, you can just take this and then take this. and It's just, just not good. So... Uh, but black played here first, and white took, and black took back, which was kind of clever, actually. It's kind of a neat move, because if he takes here right away, and white goes there, there's this threat here. And that's getting very awkward, because knight d5 is going to be a move really soon, too. That's kind of an interesting idea. Anyway, the main idea here is he's hoping that... White will um, retreat this, and then that queen's still trapped. Now, this is still maybe playable for black, White with a clever move like that, but at least he's getting his piece back, and he's got some got some uh, attack going. I mean, what would happen? Something like this, this. Now, something threatening checkmate. And I don't know what would happen here. But it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complicated game. Um, 
So that was kind of neat playing there. And that's uh, Gerben's move, a really clever move, nice little move. White played here, which uh, makes a lot of sense. I think it'd be easier probably to play this move. I think that'd be the right way to do it. Try to drive that rook off that file. And then if black takes, you just take back. And now you're attacking here and here. And it looks very, very good for white. Um, but, but he played here. Move the king. Not, not necessarily terrible. Um, and black took. And according to Gerben, I guess, white resigned here. Um, no, I'm sorry. Black resigned? Whoops. Oh, he took, but he also resigned. He just got disgusted with his position with knight d5 coming and queen takes d4. At least that's how I interpreted what he said. Um, but this is the end of the game. And I guess the idea is he thought after that, well, this is just, I'm doomed. Because queen takes and knight d5 and everything else. Um, but it's not that easy. Black could make a clever little move like that. And then if white takes it, he's really he's, he's risking a lot here because there's a big counterattack involving knight c4, queen b4, maybe bishop g7 at some point. I think, you know, white could take it, but he's got to defend well. So you don't resign when you've got something like that. Probably, probably white would have to come back and play here because he does have a big positional advantage here. You know, now knight d5. In fact, I don't think knight c4 is the best move. But And, and so the... You, <laughs> well, in the end, in the end here, um, white is better, much better, because of his control over this square, also because of bishop g4 coming, but probably it wasn't resignable, because there's too many things that white could still do wrong, is what it amounts to. Um, now, as far as the game as a whole, what was I going to say? I think it's pretty, pretty respectably played, and the h4, h5 idea did work out quite well. And the queen side attack worked out really well. You did everything right. Black did everything right. And then things drifted. Now, why did they drift? Um, wait a minute, where was this? Sorry. Uh, they drifted around. Okay, here, obviously, black is doing great. Oh, yeah, black could just win sort of straight away. So I would say your tactics were a little funny here. Just You just need to do checks, captures, forcing moves, and you know, ask how the heck is he going to answer this move, right? Um, and e5 is also a good move, as you played. Um, but, well, no, it's not a good move, is it? It just, it just doesn't, yeah, it just doesn't, you need to counterattack here. Oh, just moving the knight would work. There's nothing at all wrong with that. Now you still are threatening d5. This is probably resignable for white. I mean, there's, there's no way to get out. There's no way for that, that guy to retreat. Well, actually, d4 is available, so maybe you could play there. Worst comes to worst, black could play something like this and throw a knight in on that square, and then d5, and then attack the king. The king is very vulnerable here. It's it's positionally a winning game for black. I don't know if tactically it is yet, but it would have been with this move. I think that's just about the end. don't know. Like I say, may. Well, anyway. So I think you just missed a tactic here, and then you resigned too early according to, at least from what I can see, it sounds like you resigned too early and should have kept playing, but, but really e5 was the double question mark move, wasn't it, as it turned out, instead of d5, because after this you felt like you couldn't even take back directly. Let's just see, what, no, why didn't you take back directly? Oh, same problem here, double attack and knight d5 being a big issue. I guess something like this would happen, and then white would maybe defend this threatening knight d5, or chase away the rook, the rook moves somewhere, and then knight d5. Ouch. Yeah, white's doing incredibly well here. He can set up with maybe rook here followed by e5, or just play e5 straight away. <clears throat> yeah, so we're very unhappy here. This is winning for white, this particular one. So you were right to play g takes f. That was kind of a clever move. So, th so black did some clever things here. It's just you kind of miscalculated with the e5 move. Okay, what else we got here? Got a whole bunch of games people sent, and here, as usual, I haven't gotten to them. Oh, I oh, didn't know that. Sorry, Per Eric. I didn't realize there was a 2015. Maybe I did notice that, but I don't have it. Uh, probably, I mean, I would guess it'd be excellent. The first one was so good to begin with, that, and she certainly knows how to keep up with theory. So my guess is you're talking about a very good book. I haven't, I haven't specifically seen it. Peter Wells spent a bit of time on it in his book. Yes, he did. Uh, Peter Wells had a great, yeah, excellent book. Um, Tal says he expected the carrot is prep. It may be, but yeah, I don't, what do you think, John? I don't think he did that great a job 
uh, in the second match um, of preparing for the Caro. Didn't seem to me he got, didn't play it positionally very well. Um, Colin Craig, any favorite game collections of Walter Brown? Yeah, we, we already got that one, sorry. Um, yeah, okay, no more comments. And I've burned up a ton of time. I'll show another game next, maybe two games next week. I was thinking also, guys, as a possibility, maybe three games, oh more. But I, I, a possibility would be that if I could dig up a game, an instructive game every week, uh, because this is mostly instruction, this this show, it seems to me. It's kind of got an instructive feel to it. Maybe a 10 or 15 minute game, hopefully I could keep it to 10, of something I saw, even maybe just during the week. I look at a lot of games during the week, and something that would either apply to a question someone asked or just be instructive in general. So it wouldn't be one of your games, it would be actually just a game that I found. I don't know if you guys think that's a good idea, but I, I, might, I might start doing that. We need to spice up this. No, the first match, you're right. He did okay against the Karakan, didn't he? Um, Bob Finnick had played against Smizlov in their last match. Interesting. I'd forgotten that. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's talking about the Tal Bob Finnick match. There were, uh, there were two matches where Bob Finnick beat, uh, I mean, Tal beat Bob Finnick the first time in one of those famous tournament books of all time, is, uh, or match books, is Tal's book on that match. Short book, but just absolutely wonderful style, wonderful games, wonderful attitude. Tal has two of my favorite books of all time. That's one of them, and the other one is his book of his selected games. It's just absolutely amazing. Great writer and uh, just a brilliant person. Okay, so what do we have here? Uh, extra <laughs> heavy bonus coverage. Well, okay. And Moving Dutchman sort of likes that idea. I think it would be interesting. Your games, uh, I'm going to show readers' games too because that's important, but I'm thinking... Maybe we should get something where everybody benefits from a particular lesson, some sort of positional lesson, or even tactical lesson. Okay, everybody, I guess I've gone way beyond, uh, even more than usual, and I will uh, catch you next week. Send me your questions and remarks, and I don't mind uh, just reporting what you say. It doesn't even have to be a question necessarily. Just to start a discussion might be kind of fun. All right, everybody, thanks again, and see you next week.